So this morning, um, I'm going to be bringing the word and uh, just greetings from Jason. He is in Krugersdorp this weekend. Uh, he spoke at their uh, conference, Real Life Church Conference, and um, he'll be back this evening and he just sends his regards and uh, um, we'll be back next week as well to, to wrap up this series. Um, but we have been talking about hearing God and all the aspects that go into that, all the things that make it possible for us to hear God. And last week, jo Jason spoke about how we can hear God through the Bible and, you know, praying the Bible, praying verses. And I don't know how many of you have been trying to do that or doing the four by four by four, which Jason says we should have just called four by four. But um, how many have been trying that? How many have been doing the fasting practice, which I think has been incredible? Anyone in life group doing the fasting practice? It's great, isn't it? It's fantastic, fantastic content. And so today, um, I want to go into the next way that we hear God's voice. But um, I have a story to share from 1883. And last night, I realized that the date that this happened was actually 27th of August, 1883. So I was like, okay, uh, that's quite funny. But um, I don't think there's any like, woo, kind of in it. It's just... It's just funny that that is the case. Um, but anyway, in, on the 27th of August, 1883, um, ranchers in Perth, Australia, heard what sounded like gunshots. It was a very unusual sound. It sounded like gunshots, and they had no idea where it came from. And the same mysterious sound was reported in 50 geographical locations spanning one thirteenth of the globe. So, in 1883, obviously, after, after time, they got all this info together, and 13 different locations around the world um, heard, had heard this mysterious sound. And what the Australians heard that day was the eruption of a volcano on the remote Indonesian island of Krakatoa, 3,600 kilometers away. And it sounded like got, uh, gunshots. Um, that volcanic eruption, possibly the loudest sound ever measured, was so loud that the 310 decibel sound waves circled the earth at least four times. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't want to get my facts wrong. It generated 3,000 foot waves, which is like a kilometer uh, tidal wave, threw rocks a distance of 54 kilometers away and cracked one foot thick concrete walls 480 kilometers away. If you were to drill a hole from Krakatoa straight through the earth, you would get to Colombia, uh, South America. Now, in Colombia, South America, they didn't hear the sound but the atmospheric pressure that day spiked considerably and the air pressure became tense on that, on that day. Um, and that was because of the infrasonic sound waves that, that caused this, this, this pressure to happen. Um, now, the sound may not have been heard, but it was felt all the way around the world. So just because you can't hear a sound doesn't mean that it isn't there, right? Okay, so you probably all know where I'm going with this. At low levels, the sound is unnoticeable. At high levels, it cannot be ignored. If sound exceeds 110 decibels, we experience a change in blood pressure. At 141 decibels, we become nauseous. At 145 decibels, our vision becomes blurry because our eyes, our, our eyeballs vibrate. At 195 decibels, our eardrums are in danger of rupturing. And death at sound waves can happen at 202 decibels. So sound can kill you. I mean, I find that really, really interesting. Now, on the one end of the sound spectrum, you have this, what they, is referred to as the sperm whale, the loudest animal on earth. The clicking noise that it makes to echolocate can hit 200 decibels. So you don't want to be close to that whale when it's echolocating, okay? 
Even more impressive, researchers believe that a whale's song may travel up to 16,000 kilometers underwater. Next to the sperm whale is a jet engine. That's 150 decibels. Air horns, 129 decibels. Thunderclaps, 120 decibels. And jack hammers, 100 decibels. What's on the other end of the sound spectrum? A whisper, measuring at just 15 decibels. So this morning, I'm going to be taking us into 1 Kings 19 with the prophet Elijah. And um, that is such an interesting event that happened. I always find it so interesting. Whenever I read it, I'll read it over and over again. And it's just so interesting what happens. Because Elijah is this prophet, almost the only prophet left in Israel who hasn't been killed by the prophets of Baal or Baal, as some people say. Um, And he has um, gone to um, these prophets and the king um, to say, look, I'm going to prove to you that, that my God is the one true God. And he does this whole thing where he gets them to cut up an animal and put it onto the altar and, and get them to pray all day um, and all afternoon, asking their God, Baal, to bring fire down from heaven and to burn up this animal on the altar. And so, of course, nothing is happening. They are ululating. They are dancing. They are going crazy around the altar. And as was custom then, they're even cutting themselves, and it's a mess. And you can just imagine. Anyway, after some time, they obviously give up, and Elijah says, okay, it's now my turn. And he goes to the altar that they had broken down, the altar of God, and he rebuilds it, and he cuts up the the animal, puts it on there, digs a deep trench around it, and he calls them to pour um, not one jar, and I don't know if it was a jar or a jar, but one jar of water all over the altar. Not once, not twice, but three times. So this thing is flooded in water, it's wet. And all he does is he just looks up to heaven and he says, God, can you bring fire down? Like he wants to prove that he is the one true God. And God licks up that entire altar as he pours down fire from heaven. Even the Bible even says the water in the trench around the altar. Now, you would think after something like that, Elijah is like, I told you so, I told you so, you know, that kind of like, but he's had this amazing moment and then he finds out that Jezebel wants to have him killed because he had all those prophets of Baal killed and now she wants to have him killed. So he flees, and he runs off into um, the, the desert, and he wants to go, go to a place called Mount Sinai. Now, what I found really interesting was that just recently, Cindy went to visit Vaughan in Israel, and they showed us a photo of, I don't know, is Cindy or Vaughan here? Uh, Vaughan's probably outside because he's doing, but this area, um, the, the photo they showed us, it's nothing of nothingness. It's just barren, barren, barren. Mountains, rocky mountains with not desert, black rocks. You've got to walk on rocks. And this is kind of a similar area to where Elijah found himself going into, t- towards Mount Sinai. And he decided that he is going to go and try and get away and, you know, maybe he'll hear from God. And so Elijah now is is he's, he's Going away from Jezebel, he's, he's going to this remote place because he really desperately wants to hear from God. Anyone ever find themselves in that place where it's like, God, I just want to hear from you. And you don't know what to do, but you just know, like, I need something. And bingo, what does he do? He goes to Mount Sinai in the middle of nowhere to a place where God had spoken in power before. This is where Elijah went to hear from God. You see, when Elijah fled to Mount Sinai, he was returning to a sacred place where God had met Moses when he gave him the Ten Commandments for his people. God gave Elijah special strength to travel that distance, and this is important, okay? 
the angel of the Lord met Elijah where he was resting under a broom tree. And he, and he woke him up, and right there was food and water for him to drink, was, was bread that had been baked on stone for him to eat and drink. Then he slept some more, and the angel woke him up again and said, eat some more because you're going to travel a far distance. And so what he does is on his way to Mount Sinai, he fasts just as Moses had done, and Jesus after him for 40 days and 40 nights. And why I think this is relevant is because we're busy doing the fasting practice, And one of the ways to really get your soul to a place to hear God is to also fast. It's to actually starve the flesh, as Jason explained, not the flesh, but the the soul of any distraction so that you can hear God. So here you've got Elijah returning to a place where God had spoken in power before. He's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights because the journey was about 320 kilometers. So that food, that little bit of food that he had sustained him for that 320 kilometers. Then we read from 1 Kings 19, verse 9 to 13, and you can follow along on the screen. It says, there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard heard it, he wrapped his face in the cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And before I carry on, I want to point out that I don't think God was asking him, what are you doing here? Like God didn't know what he was doing there. I think he was asking, what are you looking for being here? What what are you doing here in the sense of what are you after? Where are you in your soul? Where are you in your relationship with me? What are you doing here? Now, the human voice, going back to sound, has a range in terms of frequency that ranges from 85 hertz to 2,500 hertz. And it would be a rare person that gets to 2,500. I don't think even Mariah Carey can get to to 2,500 hertz. On the other hand, the human ear can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Okay? So our voice um, can do 85 to 2,500, and our ears can hear 20 to 20,000. Anything below 20 hertz is called infrasonic. And infrasonic is a sound that you can't hear with your ear, but it's still a sound. It still exists. It's just at a lower frequency. Infrasonic sound, though, has an effect. It can give you a headache. It detects earthquakes, and it detects volcanic eruptions and and many other things. Anything above 20,000 hertz is called ultrasound. An ultrasound would be more common to us. We would know more about it. It's a high-frequency frequency sound wave that's beyond the limit of human hearing. And ultrasound uh, waves can crush kidney stones, can see an unborn baby in a, in a mother's womb, um, can heal um, damaged tissue. And the thing with ultrasound is it can also topple a building. So you've got these two extremes of, of sound. You've got these, like the volcano in, in Krakatoa that caused so much damage and that people 3,600 kilometers could hear. And then you've got sound waves that we can't hear, but we feel the effect of. So you've got all these different ways that sound works. And so the reason I'm telling you this this morning is that God speaks in a variety of ways and frequencies. God speaks in different ways, and he wants us to be ready to hear um, the different ways that he speaks to us. Can God speak audibly? Yes, he can. 
And yes, he does, and yes, he has. There might be people here today, there might be some of you here today who, who can say that you've heard God speak audibly. It's not as common, and if you take the entire Bible, not many people heard God speak audibly, but God can speak audibly. Sometimes the frequency that we hear God is through dreams. Sometimes it's through other people. You could be praying and asking God for guidance in a situation, and you, you end up having a conversation. Let's say I, I have a conversation with Steve, and Steve is telling me something, and exactly what he's saying is speaking into my situation. He doesn't know it, but I know it. That's a frequency that God uses to speak to, to us. Maybe um, God speaks to you through the Bible into a certain situation, or in your prayer time, you, you hear him um, speak to you about a situation. He uses all of these different ways, these different frequencies of speaking to us. God also sometimes looks at our pain, and he uses his outside voice to speak into our pain, where we just feel him so clearly speak into our pain that we, are, that we will be okay or that he is there, like Taddy shared this morning, he won't leave us, he won't forsake us. So in our pain, it's like he's almost shouting into that pain. That's another frequency that he uses. But he won't use that all the time, okay? He uses different frequencies. Sometimes it's a prompting. Sometimes it's an open door. Many, many different ways. And as Christians, we have, I know for myself, I had, I, I often used to have a preconceived idea as to how God should speak to me. God can, I just like zzz through the Bible and whatever I land on, that's you speaking to me. Or can I be sitting in a service and the pastor says, Linnell, the God says, you know, that would be so easy and convenient. Um, God, but do you know what that does? It makes us lazy. If that's the only way we ever expect God to speak to us, it makes us lazy. Now, we know that God speaks to us in different ways. We've been hearing it over the last few weeks, that he speaks through the prophetic. He speaks through prayer. Sometimes, though, God whispers, like we saw in verse 12, where it said, And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Elijah heard God in a gentle whisper. Now, some translations, that's the, the, the New Living Translation, some translations refer to a still, small voice, which is actually closer to the original Hebrew. It's interesting when you look at the um, original Hebrew, which translated means a silent sound or a thin, silent sound. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like an oxymoron. How can a sound be silent? But as we've heard... Sound comes in all different ways and means. So it's actually not an oxymoron because it's a silent sound. In the Hebrew language, the phrase for gentle whisper is, I mean, I cannot speak the language, but call the mama daka. Okay, amen. The sound of thin silence. That's where the Lord meets us in the gentle whisper. He meets us in that thin silence. He met Elijah in that thin, silent sound. And I love that, that that is how God also speaks to us. You can have sound you can't hear, but it's still a sound wave with great effect. A sound wave you can't hear has the power to topple buildings, as I told you. It can sense earthquakes, as I've mentioned. Um, so here I'm talking about the silent sound, and the NLT calls it a whisper. What does the dictionary say a whisper is? The dictionary says that it's to speak very softly without using one's, uh, sorry, it's to speak softly using one's breath without using one's vocal cords. That's what the dictionary defines a whisper as. Okay, so a silent sound. Some of you, God wants to whisper today. Some of you, God maybe wants to use his outside voice. But we have to position ourselves to hear that whisper. 
And the thing that's true about a whisper is that if you don't listen really close, you won't hear it. And then what will happen is you'll come to the conclusion that God's not speaking to you. It's like, oh, well, I can't, God's obviously not speaking to me. This must be a dry season. But I think that God whispers to us a lot. We just don't listen for the whisper. Sometimes we ask God to speak to us, and we don't hear him the first time, so we assume he has nothing to say, and then we feel like we've put ourselves out there, and we feel let down because we're not hearing him, or we think we're not hearing him. Or maybe he's not speaking in the way we expected. Now remember that Elijah went to Mount Sinai expecting a Mount Sinai experience, because when Moses was in Mount Sinai, God did speak in the loud rumbling and, and thunder. It was, it was loud. It was clear that it was God speaking. So Elijah went to Mount Sinai, I, I think, looking for that same experience. And when we have had an experience like that from God, we can have the tendency to look for the same experience, to look for the same environment where we can experience the same feelings we had before. So maybe you heard God, maybe you went to a revival service, maybe you went to a conference, maybe you went to stand camp, maybe you went to a church camp, maybe in church itself through a moment of loud worship or um, a, a, a preacher speaking who spoke into your life. And so every time you want to hear God, you look for that same experience. You look for that same environment and that same feeling. But what we're doing when we do that is we're putting God into a box. Because then we're saying that there's only one way God can speak to us. God, but I had that experience with you 20 years ago. Why won't you do it again? And we're going to get more into that. I want you to think about this. Some of you have put yourself out there about a certain situation. Maybe you're fasting, maybe you're talking to a friend, or you've tried to take yourself to a place where you've experienced them before, um, and you haven't heard anything. And so you think he's not speaking. I want to suggest to you today that he wants to grow you and stretch you just a little bit. That God wants you to hear him in a different frequency. He wants you to think out of the box. And what are some of the things that stop us from hearing um, God's voice? First of all, sin. When we continue in a sin, it, it, it starts to separate us from God. So just as forgiveness cleans us up, sin clogs us up. Another way that we can stop hearing God's voice is noise. Ruth Haley Barton said that we are starved for quiet. To hear the sound of sheer silence, that is the presence of God himself. To hear the sound of sheer silence is to hear God, it's to be in God's presence. Another way that we can stop hearing God's voice is neglect. If you neglect your body, what is going to happen? You're going to get sick. You're going to get malnourished. You're going to, you know, if you never ever get into the sun and get vitamin D, you're going to get illnesses that are caused by a lack of vitamin D. So when we neglect our relationship with God, we stop hearing his voice. When we know what to do and we neglect it, then we can't hear him anymore. And a fourth way is inexperience. Maybe you're a new Christian and you say, but I don't know where to start. I don't know how to hear. I, what, where do I start in the Bible? What do I say when I pray? How do I fast? In experience, all that means is get yourself around people who can teach you, who can share their journey, who can show you what to read in the Bible. That is how... Um, you go from inexperience to a little bit of experience. So it's easy to miss God's voice when it comes to you in a gentle, hushed whisper. And so I'd like us to open our hearts and our minds today to the fact that God has most likely been speaking to you in a gentle whisper already, okay? And so now all you have to do is to position yourself to hear that gentle whisper. And like any language, anyone ever learned a language that's not your mother tongue? 
That's how most students today feel about Afrikaans. Okay? Any one of your children speak Afrikaans, try and speak Afrikaans to you using English words but with an Afrikaans accent. That's my experience. It's the most hilarious thing ever. But like any language, it takes time to learn it. So don't go today, sit, a, <clears throat> okay, it didn't work. You've got to practice and practice and practice, just like speaking a, a, a new language. So there's some things that I want to draw your attention to that I believe will help us to hear God's whisper. And the first point is that God's whisper is powerful. Don't underestimate the power of God's um, whisper. Don't mistake the absence of volume for the absence of power. If a whisper is using one's breath without using your vocal cords, I want you to think for a moment about God's breath. When God breathed, what happened? Let's look at Genesis 2, 2 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life, into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Isn't that incredible? God didn't say, Adam, you're, you're it. He breathed, just, whew. he breathed, and Adam was living. God's whisper, not using his vocal cords, but using his breath to speak, can bring life to a situation that is dead, can bring life to a marriage that feels like it's, it, it's got nowhere more that it can go, can bring life into our children that are off the path. God's breath can bring life to death. An example, you're going to think, why am I sharing this? But it, it, it just helps me to understand how important breath is. We breathe, we take it for granted until it's not there, right? <laughs> I remember when my Oma, um, when, when she passed away, she was actually at a women's meeting at the Methodist Church and in Edgemead, and she was sitting at, at a table, and the pastor's uh, wife, he came in and sat next to her, and she, hi, Cora, how are you? How are you doing? And she said, oh, I feel very tired. And she put her head on her shoulder, and she told us that all she heard was, <sighs> And my Oma passed away on her shoulder. And I'll always remember that because as that, that, that breath, that last breath, it was like God gave her breath to live and then he took her breath and called her home. And I'll always remember that because there's something so powerful in that image in my mind of her just that, that she said that her breath was so clear. It was so clear as she breathed out. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. The Bible is God whispering to you. If you want to know what God is saying, remember the Bible is God-breathed. It's God whispering to you. Then my next point, number two, is that we need to draw close. Thank you. Okay, so obviously we planned that. <laughs> the point of that demonstration was that somebody had to get up and draw close to me to hear what I was saying. Pat had to get up and not only stand here, she had to come right up to my face to hear what I was saying, and she heard clearly what I asked her, and I did not use my vocal cords. All God wants is to, for us to draw close to him. We need to draw intimately close to him, spend time with him, and learn to hear his still silent sound, which is his whisper. Do you know that that's why he speaks in a whisper? because he actually wants to draw as close to us as is divinely possible. He loves us. He likes us that much. God likes you that much. 
that he wants to draw so close to you because who knows that whispering is quite personal. If I had called somebody that doesn't know me, they might have felt a bit awkward with my breath in their ear, but Pat and I know each other very well. We've traveled overseas together. We have we even slept in the same bed. Like, we really know each other well. Okay. So, what I'm trying to say is that it's so intimate, so personal, to actually feel God whispering, but not into your ear, into your spirit. It's whispering into your spirit. He wants you to draw close. And guys, the purpose of a fast, the purpose of a prayer meeting, the purpose of your prayer time, the purpose of reading the word is to get close so that you can feel his breath and hear what he is saying. That is the purpose of those things. You know what it's like for those of you that are married or um, are in a, in a relationship where you know somebody really, really well, after a while, you have nonverbal communication, right? You have cues. So I know Jason's voice and his tone really well. I know what different things mean, which is probably why I sometimes react in the front out of, you know, fear that like, Jason, don't say it like that, because I know what he means. But we have nonverbal cues. So um, if we go out somewhere and I... I can get so tired, especially before my operation, so my iron was really low, that I would, I would know it's time for me to go. But I don't want to, like, make it awkward. And so, that he, so he would know that a squeeze on the knee means Susan needs to go. Okay? I didn't have to say anything. There was a nonverbal cue, right, that he would know what I mean. A certain look. Those of you that are married, do you know your wife's look? Okay? If I'm annoyed with Jason in public, he gives me a certain look that I know I better rick myself rach right now or there's going to be problems because he gets angry or embarrassed if I'm angry with him in public. You know? So he'll say, change your face. Change your face. But now he doesn't say it anymore. Now he just looks at me and I know he's meaning change your face. Okay? So... We, we have, when you know somebody really well, you have these nonverbal things that happen between you. It's the same with God. You just have a prompting. You have a feeling. Your spirit jumps at a certain sense that God is whispering. You start knowing the difference between the enemy's voice and God's voice, between somebody just saying something that sounds nice compared to when God is saying it. There's that drawing close, and you don't even need to use words. We need to hear what God has to say more than what God needs to hear what we have to say, because God knows our hearts, but how do we know what he is saying if we just keep talking and we never, ever listen? Have you ever thought, I mentioned earlier on about the ultrasound. Anyone ever gone for an ultrasound and the doctor goes, Oh, and there's this, and there's that, and this is so many centimeters, and all I see is gray. And I'm like, okay, if you say so. You know, and he's like, your ovary is this big, and I'm like, how can you tell from that gray to that gray where it starts and where it stops? But think about it. They have to study for so many years intimately and know what they are looking at. We need to study God intimately so that we know his voice. If you aren't willing to listen to everything God has to say, eventually you won't hear anything he has to say. And because sometimes he says things we don't like. Like, rick yourself rach, right? I don't like it when he says that to me. But if I'm going to push that aside, eventually I'm not going to hear anything that he says. And then my third and last point, if we want to hear God's voice, we need to quiet the noise. Everyone just be quiet for a moment. That's not even quiet because we can hear the, the, the lights on. We can hear. So there is so much noise that to actually get to a point where we can quiet the noise, for example, we have so many voices shouting for us, our family, our careers, um, our hobbies and sports. Um, what else did I write here? Um, Netflix, 
social media. It's all shining for your attention. Hey, hey, hey. And you're like, uh, like a ping pong ball machine. You can't keep up because you're like, okay, I'm, okay, no, no, okay, wait, wait. Okay, uh, anyone ever do that thing where you're busy with something? You go here and you can't remember why you went there. Because your brain is like zzz, constant with noise and, and, and busyness. Elijah knew that the sound, Elijah knew that the sound of a gentle whisper was God's voice. He realized that God doesn't reveal himself only in powerful, miraculous ways. To look for God only in something big, like I mentioned earlier on, only in revivals or like well-known preachers who have like a lot to say, to only look for it in that may be to miss him because he is often found gently whispering in the quietness of a humbled heart. That's where God will find you. When you quieten down the noise and you come before him with a humble heart, willing to hear whatever he has to say, that's when he can speak. Distraction, do you know that distraction minimizes prayer and it empties it of its power? I don't know about you, but I can't pray. There's a thousand other things going on. Because prayer should actually be more silence than talking. Silence is not passive praying, it's active listening. And in Psalm 46 verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Because if you want to hear the heart of God, silence is key. If you want to have God fool you, you need to learn to be silent. And silence is the difference between sight and insight. Silence is the difference between happiness and joy. Silence is the difference between fear and faith. That's where you find those things. That's where God can breathe that into your life, is in silence. And maybe you need to do something different. Maybe you're doing the same thing, expecting a different result. And so this is what I want to encourage you with. Change of pace. We can just put that up. Change of pace plus change of place equals change of perspective. Maybe you need to change something. Change how you have your time with God. Still have your time with God, but maybe just change it up. Change the place, and it'll change your perspective. We think that the goal of hearing God is hearing God, but that's not God's goal. His goal is intimacy with us. So He speaks in a whisper, and we have to get really close to hear Him. And I think that God wants us to get close to Him, not only to hear His voice, but to hear His heart. Because so often, when we don't listen carefully and we misunderstand, maybe, maybe it is a rebuke. Maybe there is something he wants to challenge you on and you don't like to hear that. But maybe you're just misunderstanding his heart. God's whisper is the breath of life. And think about it. God breathed into the valley of bones and the bones came to life. And I want us to even bring this to Jesus right now. Jesus breathed his last breath on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, so that he could make a way for us to have an intimate relationship with God. But then in the tomb, God breathed life back into Jesus. And so... There are times where you might feel like you've taken your last breath in a situation. You can't anymore. You don't know what to do. You can't see how this is gonna come out. Allow God to breathe life back into that situation by finding the quiet, by finding the stillness, by, by quietening the space around you, by accepting and 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 being okay with the fact that his whisper is powerful 
Don't only wait for the loud voice to yell at you, to shout at you, to call you out. Seek Him in that quiet place. Nothing has the potential to change your life like the whisper of God. Nothing will determine your destiny more than your ability to hear His still small voice. That's how you discern the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. That's how you see and seize divine appointments. That's how God-sized dreams are birthed. That's how miracles happen. And when I just got saved in 99, I went on a young adult's camp, which was then with, with View Church Table View, and it was at SOS. And I remember being in the session with, uh, where they were preaching and, and um, doing worship, and then afterwards people were praying for each other, and I felt ill. It was like I just was struggling to be in that environment. And I was getting anxious and, 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 I, and I was feeling like I just wanted to run away. And so um, I went and, and sat in one of the, the cabins that was empty. And I just remember sitting there. And for those of you that know SOS, I mean, it was at night. It was quiet. There was, there was no noise because it was far away from where all the activity was happening. And I remember sitting down on the floor with my hands in my, with my head in my hands, just desperate like, God, um, I've come from a life that has been so far from you, that has been so broken and so dysfunctional, and I just want to find you. I just want to know you. I want to know your heart. I want to try and understand what, what this is all about, what the, a relationship with you looks like. But I was the type of person that carried a lot of burdens. I carried burdens for my sister who was very young then. I carried burdens for my father and his alcoholism. I carried burdens, um, I carried the, 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 the weight of having lost my mom young and I was just this, I was, I was almost like too old for my age. And I just, I had all these burdens and, I, and as I was sitting there, I remember so clearly the soft, gentle whisper of Jesus because I didn't know scripture, I didn't know what it meant. But as he came to me and he said, give me your burdens and I will carry them. And I actually remember sitting that quiet and going, <gasps> like I looked up because I got such a fright because it wasn't something that I could have possibly made up myself. And that day I felt like something was released, that, that I, I felt younger, I felt free. I felt like even though those things were still there, God was going to help me. He was going to carry me through it. And so the reason I'm sharing that with you is because I so desperately want that for you. I want you to experience the gentle, silent sound of God's whisper because that whisper will change your life. And the last thing I'm going to say as we close in prayer is that you need to position yourself to hear that whisper. Find a way to get into silence. And if the only place in your house is the toilet, start there. I don't know what else to say but that. We have five, seven people on our property and a dog who is worse than all seven people put together with how much he needs attention. So I've, I've got to make a plan. I have to make it work. I have to silence myself even if Jason comes in and out the bedroom. I have to make it work. Otherwise, how am I going to hear God's voice? 